familiar sign posted in petroleum refineries and chemical plants throughout the country. It is a warning to all that hydrogen sulfide, a killer gas, is apt to be present and that people unskilled in dealing with it should stay away. This is the story of that invisible killer and of the vicious threat it poses to human life. But it is also the story of how men in medicine and industry have learned to harness its lethal power and safeguard the lives of thousands of workers through education, rescue techniques, and protective equipment. Although the action takes place in one refinery and petrochemical plant, the information applies to any industrial plant where H2S is used as a chemical agent or where it is produced as a manufacturing byproduct. In a refinery, much of the lethal hydrogen sulfide arrives in tanker shipments of sour crude oil or naphtha. The term sour is applied to those materials which contain high percentages of volatile sulfur compounds, including H2S. Tanker crewmen and men handling cargo hoses must be ever alert to avoid breathing H2S when working with such shipments. From tankers, the sour crude or naphtha is pumped through miles of pipelines to storage tanks, where the H2S will again lie in wait for a careless human act. Minutes after a filling operation starts, the atmosphere in a tank can contain enough H2S to kill a man in seconds and without warning. Measuring the contents of such tanks, these gauges know that only wise men are live men, so they take the proper precautions, one of which quite often is to have a buddy standing by with his fresh air mask at the ready. Well-meaning but ill-prepared rescuers often become victims themselves. On a processing unit where the prime purpose of the operation is to remove H2S from the feedstock, dangerous amounts of H2S may leak from a faulty packing gland on a pump and set the trap for the unwary or careless worker. or venting a pump may set the trap. Or inspecting a sewer. Or opening a pipeline. In many cases, the manufacturing process itself generates large quantities of H2S. Depending on the pressures within the system, the condition of the detection and alarm system and other equipment, the normally safe area could at any time become a gas chamber for an innocent victim. This operator uses a detector to determine the exact source of the H2S leak. As H2S passes through the glass tube containing grains of a chemical, the grains turn from gray to black. But what about the question, how and when is H2S fatal to the human system? In a concentration of as little as one-tenth of one part of H2S in a million parts of air, a slight odor of rotten eggs can be detected by most people. For others with a less acute sense of smell, odor detection would start at slightly higher concentrations. The odor becomes stronger as the concentration is increased, but then, due to a dangerous characteristic of H2S, the sense of smell is soon fatigued or deadened. And at a concentration of about 100 parts per million, after a short period of exposure, the average person might assume that the H2S had dissipated because he could no longer smell it. This should be a warning sign. At about 700 parts per million, or 700ths of 1% of H2S in air, Breathing stops and unconsciousness occurs between 5 and 60 seconds after exposure. This varies from individual to individual, depending on the state of health. 
For example, if this five ounce glass were filled with H2S and dropped into a 55 gallon drum containing clean air, the resulting mixture could knock a man out in less time than it takes to give this demonstration. Much of the information we have on H2S and its effect on the human system, we owe to men like Dr. H.W. Girard, shown here addressing a group of refinery workers. Dr. Girard, a prominent toxicologist, has done extensive work in controlled experiments to study the effects of H2S on white rats. A safer life for countless industrial workers has resulted from such studies. In his demonstration before this group of process men, Dr. Girard will show how a living being reacts to H2S poisoning and how artificial respiration, applied in time, can quickly restore the victim to normal. He places a healthy specimen in a jar under room conditions. He seals the jar. Next, he starts a chemical reaction to generate H2S in the jar. He adds a few drops of hydrochloric acid to a small amount of iron sulfide in the jar. This will generate a high enough concentration of H2S to cause acute H2S poisoning. As the H2S content rises, a human being under similar conditions might well be thinking, I smell rotten eggs. Now I don't smell anything. Now my eyes are burning and it's hard to breathe. Dr. Girard quickly removes the rat to fresh air, a must in all H2S rescues. He notes the usual symptoms, generalized convulsions, and the normally pink nose has a gray pallor. The same symptoms displayed by a human victim, except that with a human, the entire face turns gray. The heart is still beating, as it will for five to 10 minutes without respiration. But artificial resuscitation must be applied immediately in order to get oxygen into the bloodstream and then to the respiratory nerve cells and brain. Mission accomplished. Point to remember, get fresh air into the victim's lung immediately or his chance of survival is slim. Another detector of H2S is a disc of white paper soaked in lead acetate. If it turns to a metallic gray, the atmosphere is unsafe. The darker the gray, the more lethal the atmosphere. It works on the same principle as this detector shown earlier. We now know more about H2S and about how laboratory animals have been successfully revived. But what can you or I do to revive a victim? The simplest and most successful technique of applying artificial respiration to a human victim is mouth to mouth. The rescuer literally breathes new life into the victim. Here a medical staff member demonstrates mouth to mouth resuscitation on a specially designed plastic dummy to a group of employees. Now why is mouth to mouth resuscitation only demonstrated? For the simple reason as shown on this chart that this technique is the surest method known when oxygen resuscitators are not available. No method is foolproof, however, as this chart shows. Assuming that the victim has been removed to a safe area, the first point is to assure that his breathing passage is open. Note, as in this model, that when the head is tilted back, the throat passage opens. The tongue is moved to the front of the mouth and any loose dentures or foreign articles are removed with the forefinger. The hand next to the victim's body is placed under his neck as a fulcrum. The other hand, placed in the forehead, tilts the head backwards. With the throat passage clear, the nostrils are firmly pinched closed with the thumb and forefinger. The rescuer fits his open mouth over the victim's and forces air into his lungs for about two seconds. He removes his mouth for about two seconds. He repeats this cycle for as long as needed. Note that when he withdraws his mouth, he turns his head to watch the victim's chest. He does this for several reasons. First, it puts his ear next to the victim's mouth in order to hear or feel the breath being expelled. He can also see how much the chest contracts. Both indicate how much air has reached the lungs. It also helps the rescuer time himself and to know when the victim starts breathing. 
In H2S poisoning, respiration will start when enough air has replaced the H2S in the nerve cells. But now that we know more about H2S, let's return to the poor fellow who did the wrong thing at the start of this film. Did he survive? Let's take a close look. The rescuer calls for help. drags the victim to a safer spot and applies mouth to mouth immediately. Help arrives. The victim starts to revive. Training and quick action pay off. 